1 Kings 3. Now Solomon made a treaty with Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and married Pharaoh's daughter, and then he brought her to the city of David until he had finished building his own house and the house of the Lord and the wall all around Jerusalem. Now here you can see from this map, um, you've got the city of David down below. Now the east south and west part of the city of David are basically um, cliffs. So it was pretty well defensed from that angle of things. But the north was flat. And so that was very vulnerable to attack. So Solomon knew that he had to build defenses up there and build a wall. So that's what he did. And he just expanded um, Jerusalem up around that area. So you can see where Solomon's walls are up around the Kidron Valley. And farther up. So that's what it's referring to here. Now notice something here. It says, Solomon made a treaty with Pharaoh king of Egypt and married Pharaoh's daughter. Now this was a political alliance. It was good politically. It was very bad for him spiritually. Because what we see is this was really the beginning of Solomon's downfall. And just like with David, as David was ascending in power and God was blessing him and blessing him, the seeds for David's destruction and his great fall with Bathsheba were sown years before as the Lord was blessing him. And that's a, that's a warning for each one of us. As we are being blessed by God, we should not let down our defenses. We need to make sure that we're careful, you know, uh, not to let things into our lives that would... Um, cause us to, you know, compromise a little bit in our walk with God. And this is what happened. Now, technically speaking, it was not against God's law for him to marry an Egyptian woman. You know that Moses married Zipporah, who was an Egyptian. Um, but the, the key thing was that the woman that any Jewish person had to marry, if she was a foreigner, she had to be a convert she had to ascribe to belief in Jehovah God, the God of the Jews, and become a convert. They couldn't marry outside the faith, in other words. So, this becomes a real issue with, um, with Solomon. Now, I want to read to you uh, what it says in Deuteronomy chapter 7 about marrying foreign women. Now, De- Deuteronomy 7 verse 3 Basically, God is saying, when you go into the land of Canaan, He says, nor shall you make marriages with them. You shall not give your daughter to their son, nor take their daughter for your son. For they will turn your sons away from following me to serve other gods. And so the anger of the Lord will be aroused against you and destroy you suddenly. So He says this, when you go into the land of Canaan, so this is when they were still, you know, in the desert. And he gives them the book of Deuteronomy. He says, when you go in there, and all the Canaanites are in there, they're not to intermarry with any of the Canaanites. So the Egyptians were not part of the Canaanites, so technically they could marry with them if they became converts. But no um, Canaanite women whatsoever. Now, turn with me to 1 Kings chapter 11, and look what happened to Solomon. 1 Kings 11, But King Solomon loved many foreign women, as well as the daughter of Pharaoh. So Pharaoh's daughter was just the beginning. Women of the Moabites, the Ammonites, the Edomites, the Sidonians, and the Hittites, from the nations of whom the Lord had said to the children of Israel, You shall not intermarry with them, nor they with you. Surely they will turn away your hearts after their gods. Solomon clung to these in love. And he had 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines. And his wives turned away his heart. And so it was when Solomon was old that his wives turned his heart after other gods. And his heart was not loyal to the Lord his God, as was the heart of his father David. For Solomon went after Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and after Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites, Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord and did not fully follow the Lord as did his father David. Then Solomon built a high place 
for Chemosh, the abomination of Moab, on the hill that is east of Jerusalem, and for Molech, the abomination of the people of Ammon. And he did likewise for all his foreign wives who burned incense and sacrificed to their gods. So apparently, as Solomon was a young man, he just kept accumulating all of these wives and girlfriends, these concubines. And then, at some stage when he got older, they turned his heart away from God and he began to worship these other gods, just like God had said. And so this was the beginning of a downfall in his life. A compromise, a subtle compromise, but a compromise nonetheless. And it's a warning to each one of us. Meanwhile, back in chapter 3, verse 2, Meanwhile, the people sacrificed at the high places because there was no house built for the name of the Lord until those days. And Solomon loved the Lord, walking in the statutes of his father, David, except that he sacrificed and burned incense at the high places. I like this about um, Solomon. It says that Solomon loved the Lord. Um, He was beloved by the Lord. You remember that the first son that Bathsheba had um, was a product of that sin between David and Bathsheba. And he was, he was killed. He died for that. But Solomon then came next. And it says that God loved Solomon. And then Solomon loved God. Now, how does a person show his love for God? Well, Jesus said, if you love me, you will obey me. If you love me, you will obey my commandments. The way that a person shows their love for God is by following God and obeying God. And one of the most beautiful promises that Jesus ever gave to us um, comes in John chapter 14, verse 21. Listen to this promise. He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Did you catch that? He says this, If you have His commandments and keep His commandments, the Father will love you, Jesus will love you, and this, He says, I will manifest Myself to you. I will reveal Myself to you. Do you want Jesus to reveal Himself to you? Then obey what He says. So the Bible really is is axiomatic. It's self-evident. In other words, when you do what it says... Jesus Christ comes and He reveals Himself to you. It's incredible, isn't it? What a promise. So Solomon loved the Lord. And it says that he walked in the statutes of his father David. Notice though, except that he sacrificed and burned incense at the high places. Now at this time, this was sort of an interim period between when the tabernacle was where they had the Ark of the Covenant and that's where they met with God, do you remember in their wilderness wanderings, this tent, that's where the, tavern, the, the Ark of the Covenant was. And during the time that they got into the Promised Land, it was in a few different places. It was in Shiloh for a while, and then it was in a place called Nob. And then it, it ended up um, being in a place called um, Gibeon. And at that time, David took the Ark of the Covenant, which had been stolen from um, Israel, lost in battle, came back to Kirjath Jerim, and David wanted to bring that into Jerusalem. And so he did that in the early part of his reign in 2 Samuel chapter 6. He brought it in there. You remember the story. It was amazing. Um, He was just rejoicing so much, dancing around and all that. Well, the Ark of the Covenant, therefore, is in Jerusalem, But the tabernacle, what remained of it, and the bronze altar was up in a place called Gibeon. It was about six miles northwest of Jerusalem. And so um, this is where the, 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 the people of Israel, they would go to these high places, and Gibeon was one of these high places, um, because it was this interim period be- between when the tabernacle was going and when the temple was about to be built. Now, what's a high place? It's where the pagans would go on top of these mountains thinking that they could get closer to God and they would offer sacrifices. 
And so the Jews would do this too. However, they wouldn't sacrifice to false gods. They would sacrifice to the true and the living God. And for a time, God kind of allowed it until the temple was built. Okay, so this is kind of where they are. Now, in verse 4 it says, Now the king went to Gibeon to sacrifice there, for that was the great high place. That's where the, uh, the, the tabernacle was. Solomon offered a thousand burnt offerings on that altar. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night. And God said, Ask, what shall I give you? And Solomon said, You have shown great mercy to your servant David, my father, because he walked before you in truth, in righteousness, and in uprightness of heart with you. You have continued this great kindness for him, and you have given him a son to sit on his throne as it is to this day. Now, O Lord my God, you have made your servant king king instead of my father David. But I am a little child. I do not know how to go out or come in. And your servant is in the midst of your people whom you have chosen, a great number, too numerous to be counted or to, to be numbered or counted. Therefore, give your servant an understanding heart to judge your people that I may discern between good and evil. For who is able to judge this great people of yours? So Solomon has a dream while he's up there and he's making all these sacrifices. And in this dream, the Lord God, the true and the living God of Israel, appears to him and he says, Ask, what shall I give you? Ask me for anything. What do you want? And I'll give it for it. give it to you. <laughs> wow. What, what a statement. And Solomon said basically this. You've been so good to my father David, and now you've put me on his throne. But I'm just a child. He's probably about 20 years old at this point. And he says, I don't know how to go out or to come in. In other words, like a shepherd going out, leading the flock or coming in. He says, I don't know how to lead these people of yours. And so he said, Therefore, give to your servant an understanding heart to discern between good and evil. To judge your people that I may discern between good and evil. An understanding heart is literally a hearing heart. What a picture. A heart that hears what God says. This is a really awesome thing that he asks. He's, he's not asking for great riches. He's not asking for the death of his enemies. He's not even asking for a long life. He just says, I want to be a good king. I want to lead your people. They're so wonderful. They're yours. Help me lead them well. Give me a heart that hears you. Oh, you know, open my ears, open my heart that I might listen to what you're saying and do it. That's an understanding heart. This is really good of Saul. And you know what? You know who taught him that Wisdom, and this is basically what he's asking for, that wisdom is what he should get. His own father took the time as he was growing up to teach him this. How do I know that? Well, turn with me to Proverbs chapter 4 and and look at what David had said to him. Proverbs 4, in verse 1. This is Solomon writing to his son. And he says, or his children. He says, Hear, my children, the instruction of a father, and give attention to no understanding. For I give you good doctrine, do not forsake my law. When I was my father's son, tender and the only one in the sight of my mother, he also taught me and said to me, so he's saying, this is what my father David taught me, let your heart retain my words, keep my commands and live. Get wisdom. Get understanding. Do not forget nor turn away from the words of my mouth. Do not forsake her and she will preserve you. Love her and she will keep you. Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom. And in all you're getting, get understanding. Exalt her and she will promote you. She will bring you honor when you embrace her. She will, be, she will place on your head an ornament of grace 
A crown of glory she will deliver to you. He says, my dad taught me to get wisdom. And notice that he personifies wisdom as a woman. Get her. You know, get this wisdom. Get her. And so this is what he's asking the Lord. He's saying, Lord, I need wisdom in order to to really be a good leader. Help me do that. Now, let me ask you this question. What if God came to you and asked you the very same thing that He asked Solomon? And He said to you, Ask me whatever you want and I'll give it to you. How would you answer that? The way that we would answer that question tells us a lot about our hearts. What would we really want? And before you answer that question, I want you to listen to a little story. There was once a a Roman... um, He was a a nobleman in Rome. Very wealthy. He had one son who ran away from home and really caused a lot of grief to his father and embarrassed him. And basically, uh, his father then decided that he was going to leave him out of his will except for one thing. And he was going to give his entire estate to his chief butler a guy named Marcellus. And so Marcellus was going to inherit this huge fortune, everything that the father owned, except that the son got one choice of anything that the father wanted, or anything that the father had. And so when the executors of the will, after the father died, they brought the son back from where he was. He said, well, Marcellus gets everything, but you get one choice of, of anything that your father owned. And, and the son kind of stroked his beard and he goes, hmm, I get one thing of all that my father owned? I'll take Marsalis. <laughs> and when he got Marsalis, you see, he got everything that the father owned. And that is a picture for us of what we get when we receive Jesus Christ. Because the Bible tells us in Colossians that in Jesus contain all the riches of wisdom and knowledge in Him. If you lack wisdom and you have Jesus, you've got everything that you need. If you lack money and you've got Jesus, you've got everything that you need. If you lack protection and you've got Jesus, you've got everything that you need. Everything that you need for life and godliness is given to you because you have Jesus. You see? And so, you see here, Solomon here, he's asking for the right thing. But we get the right thing as soon as we receive Christ. We get everything that we need. So, this blows God away in a sense. He loves it. Look in verse 10. The speech pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this thing. And then God said to him, Because you have asked this thing, and have not asked long life for yourself, nor have asked riches for yourself, nor have asked the life of your enemies, nor have asked for yourself understanding to discern justice, or sorry, but have asked for yourself understanding to discern justice, behold, I have done according to your words. See, I have given you a wise and understanding heart, so that there has not been anyone like you before you, nor shall any like you arise after you. So, in humanly speaking, Solomon was the wisest person who ever lived, except for one person, and that's Jesus Christ. So, he, according to everyone else, he was the wisest one. And I have also given you what you have not asked, both riches and honor, so that there shall not be anyone like you among the kings of all your days. So if you walk in my ways to keep my statutes and my commandments as your father David walked, then I will lengthen your days. And so, this was kind of an if-then sort of command. He says, if you walk according to my ways then I'm going to bless you. I'm going to lengthen your days uh, just the way I've blessed your father. So as long as Saul had his priorities right with God, God blessed him. Now, God could not bless Saul if his priorities were not right. Because imagine, if God 
saw that his priorities were not right and then he blessed him financially or with the death of his enemies or with a long life, those things would have gone to his head, caused pride to well up within him, would have destroyed his life. But as long as Solomon kept the priorities right in his life, God could continually bless Solomon. Now this is a good picture for us because as long as we keep our priorities right with the Lord, then God will continually bless us in many, many ways. God wants to bless us. Every good and every perfect gift, the Bible says in James chapter 1, comes down from the Father of lights with whom there's no variation nor shadow of turning. God is pouring out blessing from heaven all the time. Abundant spiritual blessings are just being poured out. The question is, are we under the spout where the blessings are being poured out? Oftentimes, because of our misplaced priorities and our sin, we're sort of away from that place of blessing. God's just pouring it out over here like a waterfall, and we're over here. But as soon as we get our hearts right with God, we just go right up underneath the blessing. And God says, that's where I wanted you the whole time. I want to bless you. God wants to bless your life. But we've got to keep the priorities right in our lives in order for that blessing to to be poured out. Well, then Solomon awoke, and indeed it had been a dream. And he came to Jerusalem and stood before the ark of the covenant of the Lord, offered up burnt offerings, and offered up peace offerings, and made a feast for all his servants. Okay, so now he comes back down from Gibeon. He comes down to Jerusalem, and he's right in front of the Ark of the Covenant. Now, at that time, you know that the tabernacle was not there, and I don't think the Ark of the Covenant was sort of out in the middle of the open, but they put some sort of temporary tent or shelter over it until the temple could be built. But he comes down now, and he's right in front of the Ark. Now, you remember that that's where God said, I'm going to meet with you. I'll meet with you between the cherubim, on, on the Day of Atonement, that's where the, the high priest would meet. So the, this was a special area, a special place. And he, he wanted to get closer to God. Now, he's got all this wisdom, right? Now we're going to see how it starts to play out here in verse 16. Now two women, who were harlots, came to the king and stood before him. Now, I want you to just stop right there. This kind of shocks me when I think about it, um, that... There were, there were actually prostitutes within the land at this time. Now, the, the Targum of the Jews, which is like a, an Aramaic um, paraphrase of the Hebrew Bible, it says that these women were actually innkeepers, kind of like Rahab was an innkeeper. Um, so they weren't really prostitutes, but they were keeping an inn. Now, others say that that... that that's not the case. There were actually prostitutes at this time. We don't, we don't know, but some people think that they were just innkeepers. Anyway, they stood before the king, and in verse 17, one woman said, O oh my Lord, this woman and I dwell in the same house, and I gave birth while she was in the house. Then it happened the third day after I had given birth that this woman also gave birth, and we were together. No one was with us in the house except the two of us in the house. And this woman's son died in the night because she lay on him. And she arose in the middle of the night and took my son from my side while your, your maidservant slept and laid him in her bosom and laid her dead child in my bosom. And when I rose in the morning to nurse my son, there he was, dead. But when I examined him in the morning, indeed, he was not my son whom I had borne. Then the older woman, or sorry, then the other woman said, No, but the living one is my son, and the dead one is your son. And the first woman said, No, but the dead one is your son, and the living one is my son. And thus they spoke before the king, kind of bickering back and forth. And the king said, The one says, This is my son who lives, and your son is the dead one. And the other says, No, but your son is the dead one, and my son is the living one. Then the king said, Bring me a sword. And so they brought a sword before the king. And the king said, Divide the living child in two, and give half to the one, and half to the other. 
And the woman whose son was living spoke to the king, for she yearned with compassion for her son. And she said, O my Lord, give her the living child, and by no means kill him. But the other said, Let him be neither mine nor yours, but divide him. And so the king answered and said, Give the first woman the living child, and by no means kill him. She is his mother. And all Israel heard of the judgment which the king had rendered, and they feared the king, for they saw that the wisdom of God was in him to administer justice. And really wise, obviously, it's a great story of how he, he, he appealed to the, the real passionate heart of the true mother. Now, it's interesting that it says that he had wisdom to administer justice, and all the people were amazed at that. Now, as we go, <clears throat> we go on looking at the life of Solomon, um, we are going to kind of scratch our heads and think, how could a guy with so much wisdom do such dumb things? Well, what is wisdom? Well, you can define wisdom like this. Wisdom is the practical application of knowledge, or it's the skill to live life um, profitably or successfully. It's the skill to live life successfully. Now, he had been given this wisdom to administer justice and to lead the people, to make all kinds of decisions. But he didn't always use it. Now, it's one thing to have it. You know, we have wisdom in God, in Jesus Christ. But we need to use that wisdom. We need to apply it and, and, and use it in our daily living. I remember once when I was just a fairly new believer, there was an older man that I knew who took me under his wing and was discipling me. And every Friday morning, we'd meet at 7 o'clock in the morning and do an hour Bible study together. And this man was really into Scripture memory. Right, so we memorize all these scripture verses and we talk about it and stuff like that. And it was just a really great time in my life. And I remember him really trying to impress upon me, it's not enough just to memorize the Word of God, you've actually got to do what it says and live it out. And he said, one of the guys that he had discipled through the years had memorized the entire book of Romans. And yet, he was living in adultery with his um, secretary at work. And he kept just putting his finger right in my chest so I got the point. He said, the entire book of Romans and he's shacking up with this woman. And I'm like, yeah, I got it, I got it. You know, it's not enough just to, to, to have it memorized or, or to know it. You got to do it. It's in the doing is where the blessing is. And Solomon had all of this wisdom that God had given him, but he, he didn't always do it. And we're going to read about this and just think, Why would you be so dumb? But we can all fall into that, can't we? If we're not careful. Now, King Solomon was over all Israel. So they were united at this point. And these were his officials. And so he's going to list kind of his whole cabinet. Um, I'm not going to read them all, but I would just go through a few of these. Azariah, the son, or actually the grandson... When it says son, it could could also mean grandson. Um, Of Zadok, the priest. Now, Zadok was the high priest under under David. Um, uh, It says, Elahoreph and Ahijah, the sons of Shisha, who were scribes. In other words, they were secretaries of state. Jehoshaphat, the son of Ahilud, was the recorder. He was the bookkeeper. Um, Jehoshaphat was also the bookkeeper under David's reign. Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, was over the army. He took uh, uh, Joab's place when Joab was put to death. He used to be King David's um, chief bodyguard. And then Zadok and Abiathar, or Abiathar, the priests. Now these guys were ex-high priests. Now you remember... We studied in our last study that Abiathar was actually deposed and he was sent away from Jerusalem. But apparently, because of the honor of his position, he was still considered a priest. 
and maybe even um, was a counselor toward the new high priest. And of course, Zadok, his grandson, was the high priest. And then he he lists all these other people. We're not going to go through them. Um, Look in verse 7. Uh, And Solomon had 12 governors over all Israel who provided food for the king and his household. Each one made provision for one month of the year. Now, um, I've got another map for you to have a look at. Oh, it's a little hard to see from maybe back there, but you can, the, the nation of Israel is divided up into 12 areas here, with the exception of Judah. Judah is not in this accounting. So in other words, um, each one of these 12 sections, the people in Israel there had to give a certain amount of taxes and food provisions to the king. And we're going to see here, it was pretty hefty. Except for Judah, because Solomon himself was from Judah and apparently they were exempt because of that. I don't know why, um, but they were. And so... Um, he goes down this, this huge list of, of all of these. In each one of these sections, each one of these um, 12, one month a year they were to provide everything that the king would eat. Um, so now go down to verse 20. So Judah and Israel were as numerous as the sand by the sea in multitude, eating and drinking and rejoicing. So Solomon reigned over all kingdoms from the river that is the Euphrates, to the land of the Philistines as far as the border of Egypt. They brought tribute and served Solomon all the days of his life. Now, back in Genesis, I want you to turn there with me. Genesis chapter 15. There was a covenant that God made with Abram. In Genesis 15 and verse 18. This is called the Land Covenant, or some call it the Palestinian Covenant. It's an offshoot of the Abrahamic Covenant, given in Genesis chapter 12, where God told him he was going to give him the land. But here, he lays down specifically what this is. Genesis chapter 15, verse 18. It says, On the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your descendants I have given this land, from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates. The Kenites, the Kenizzites, the Cadmonites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Rephaim, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Girgashites, and the Jebusites. From the Euphrates River all the way to the land of Egypt, he says, I've given it to your descendants. Notice the, the verbiage, I have given it to them. It's a, it's a done deal. Now, at this point, you see here back in 1 Kings 4.21, it says Solomon reigned over all of that area. However, this is not a fulfillment of that promise. Why not? Because even though he reigned over it in a sense that the kingdoms in, in those areas, you can see up there Aram and Bashan and Ammon and Gad, these areas over here, they gave tribute to the king, the the Israelite nations did not inhabit that landmass. So, this, by the way, is what we would call the zenith of power for the nation of Israel. It is the farthest reach, the biggest territory that they ever had was at this time so far, and they only got about twenty percent of what God has ultimately promised them. They're going to get it someday. Because you see, this, this promise, this Palestinian covenant that God made with Abram is what we refer to as an unconditional covenant. It means it doesn't depend on Abraham keeping it. Because prior to, if you, if you read the 15th chapter, Abraham was asleep when God made this covenant with him. God made it with himself. He just said, I'm giving it to you. So it's unconditional. It didn't depend on his performance or the performance of the Jews. Whereas like the law of Moses, that was a conditional covenant. It depended on the performance of the Jews. And if any of us are trying to 
get a blessing from God or get ourselves right with God by our own performance, we're never going to make it. Because we can't do it in and of ourselves. We have to depend on Jesus in the new covenant that's in His blood. That's an unconditional covenant. We just receive it by faith, you see? So, this Palestinian covenant is yet to be fulfilled. Well, when is it going to be fulfilled? Well, when Jesus comes back again, He's going to rule and reign for a thousand years upon this earth, seated on the throne of David, as the son of David, as the one who can keep uh, the law of God perfectly, and did. And He will receive that, that promise. He's going to rule and reign over all that territory. The nation of Israel will, will get it in that time. So, not yet, but it will be. Now, Solomon's provision for one day was 30 cores of fine flour. Now, we don't measure things in cores anymore, but this is about 100 bushels, and it says 60 cores of meal. I don't even know what a bushel is, really, but it must be a lot. Uh, So, imagine, though, a bushel is kind of like a big bag. Uh, So, we're talking about, that's a lot of bread and wheat and you name it. Um, Also, 10 fatted oxen, 20 oxen from the pastures, must be skinnier, I guess, 100 sheep, besides deer, gazelles, roebucks, and fatted fowl. So, chunky chickens. Now, do you remember... (laughs) I mean, this is a lot of food. This was his um, daily ration. Now, think about this. Now, it wasn't like Solomon was super fat or anything like that, but... He had 700 wives. He had 300 girlfriends, and he's providing for all of them, plus all the people that were living at the palace. I mean, it's a massive amount of food, right? When the children of Israel were asking for a a king, you remember Samuel said, you know what, you guys, when you ask for a king, it's not going to be a cakewalk. It's not going to be easy. This king is going to ask you for a lot of taxes and a lot of other things. <laughs> Let me just read to you what he says. This is in um, uh, 1 Samuel chapter 8. He says, This will be the ha- behavior of the king who will reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them for his own chariots and to be his horsemen, and some will run before his chariots. He will appoint captains over his thousands and captains over his fifties, and will set some to plow his ground and reap his harvest, and some to make his weapons of war and equipment for his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers, cooks, and bakers. He will take the best of your fields, your vineyards, and your olive groves and give them to his servants. He will take a tenth of your grain and your vintage and give it to his officers and servants. And he will take your male and male servants, your female servants, your finest young men and your donkeys and put them to work. And he will take a tenth of your sheep and you will be his servants. And you will cry out in that day because of your king whom you have chosen for yourselves and the Lord will not hear you in that day. (laughs) This is, nevertheless, the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel and they said, no, but we will have a king. (laughs) Yeah, we hear what you're saying, but yeah, we want one anyway. So, man, this was a lot of stuff that they had to give every single day. Verse 24, For he had dominion over all the region on this side of the river, that is the Euphrates, from Tipsa even to Gaza, namely over all the kings on this side of the river, and he had peace on every side all around him. And Judah and Israel dwelt safely, each man under his vine and his fig tree, from Dan as far as Beersheba, all the days of Solomon. So from Dan to Beersheba, that's north to south, And then it also says from east to west. There's peace all around, plus provision. It was just really good times in Israel at this point. Solomon had 40,000 stalls of horses for his chariots. Now, this is probably a scribal error in the Hebrew because we see in 2 Chronicles 9.25, not 40,000 but 4,000 stalls. And we reckon that because it says 12,000 horsemen. So, 
That would be about right. If there were 4,000 horses, there would be about 12,000 horsemen. And these governors, each man in his month, provided food for King Solomon and for all who came to King Solomon's table. There was no lack in their supply. They also brought barley and straw to the proper place for the horses and steeds, each man according to his charge. Now, this may not be be apparent, but you should put a big no exclamation mark right beside where it says that um, Solomon uh, got lots and lots of horses. Because back in the book of Deuteronomy, in chapter 17, God lists some of the commands for the king when the king uh, takes charge. And it says this, When you come to the land which the Lord your God is giving you and possess it and dwell in it, and say, I will set a king over me like all the nations that are around me, you shall surely set a king over you whom the Lord your God chooses. One from among your brethren you shall set as king over you. You shall not set a foreigner over you who is not your brother. Notice, but he shall not multiply horses for himself, nor sh- nor cause the people to return to Egypt to multiply horses, for the Lord has said to you, you shall not return that way again. And then notice this, neither shall he multiply wives for himself, lest his heart turn away, nor shall he multiply greatly, greatly multiply silver and gold for himself. Those three things were the exact same things that Solomon began to do. He began to multiply horses, multiply wives. And it says, we'll find later on, that silver was so common in Israel, it was just considered like nothing. It was considered like gravel that you just walk on. That's how rich he was. He just multiplied all of this wealth. So, I write in my Bible, no exclamation mark, don't. Don't go for all of these horses, nor for the, all of those women. Now in verse 29, And God gave Solomon wisdom and exceedingly great understanding in largeness, largeness of heart like the sand of the, on the seashore. Thus Solomon's wisdom excelled the wisdom of all the men of the east and all the wisdom of Egypt. And now, he, for he was wiser than all men. He's going to list here some of the sages of Israel. Then Ethan the Ezraite. Now this was a guy who actually wrote Psalm 89. If you read Psalm 89, it says it was written by this musician, Ethan the Ezraite. And another man named Heman. He-man. He wrote Psalm 88. And then Chalcol and Darda, the sons of Mahal. And his fame was in all the surrounding nations. He spoke 3,000 proverbs and his songs were 1,005. So when you read through the book of Proverbs, and by the way, it's a really good book to read um, if you want wisdom. It's wisdom literature. Good just to go through it, think it through, apply it to your life. Um, That's just a sampling of some of his proverbs that he wrote. He also wrote the book of Ecclesiastes, and if you read through that, you can see some of the things that he did that were really dumb. But some of the things that he says in there are pretty wise. So it's kind of a mix. I don't make doctrinal statements out of the book of Ecclesiastes, by the way, except for the very last one. Because uh, there he says, you heard the sum of the matter? Here, here's the sum. Fear God and keep His commandments. This is the, this is the whole duty of man. So he, he, he comes back to um, right thinking at the end of it. So he wrote all of these Proverbs. And his songs were 1,005. The most famous of his songs was the Song of Solomon. If you get a chance to read that, it's a beautiful picture, not only of Christ and the church, but it's actually a picture of the love that Solomon had between him and one of his wives. And it's actually a book that they will not allow young Hebrew children to read because it depicts sexual love. It's very graphic. So he writes this beautiful song and a, and a 
1005. Also he spoke of trees from the cedar tree of Lebanon, even to the hyssop that springs out of the wall. He spoke of animals, of birds, of creeping things, and of fish. And men of all nations, from all the kings of the earth, who had heard of of his wisdom, came to hear the wisdom of Solomon. Remember Jesus said this. um, He said about the queen of Sheba, she'd come to hear the wisdom of Solomon, but a greater than Solomon is, is here. You know, he has the fullness of wisdom and knowledge. Now, as we close, I know that all of us, from time to time, we go through difficult trials. And in those times of trials, we don't know what to do. There are times when we're in the midst of it and we just don't know what decision to make, how to get out of it. We just don't know what to do. In James chapter 1, James says, Rejoice when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patient endurance. But let patience have its perfect work that you may be complete um, and equipped, thoroughly equipped, uh, complete and not lacking anything. He says, uh, rejoice. Now, how many of us rejoice when we fall into various trials? That's a difficult one. But he says this next. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. So in the midst of your trials, when you don't know what to do, he says, ask, and God will give you wisdom. So, God, I don't know what to do. Give me wisdom. I I need to know how to respond in this very trial. And God says, it will be given to you. But he says this, But let him ask in faith without doubting. For he who doubts is like the wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. Let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. So when you ask him for wisdom, don't doubt that he'll give it to you because he's promised it. And so when you need that wisdom, ask in faith and God will give it to you. And then you can just go on, make the decision that you need to make, assuming that God is guiding you in it. So that's really um, God's promise to us. If you lack it, ask Him. Just ask. Father, we thank You for Your Word tonight. We thank You, Lord, that we can learn from the life of Solomon and the things that he did right and good and also some of the things that he didn't do well. And Lord, we all need wisdom. We want to apply knowledge appropriately and we need the skill to live life successfully. So would you please help us to have wisdom in our daily life, to make good choices. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.